the problem was the police only seemed to have one motive. And that motive seemed to be that everything generated from the marital split. They were not looking at any other scenario whatsoever. That was the direction the train was on, on the tracks, and then it never came off after that. How many names can you think of that when you say them, in, in whatever context, they always elicit an opinion? Maybe Mark McGowan? Probably Gina Reinhart? Definitely Lloyd Rainey. Mention Mr. Rainey to virtually anyone in Perth and well beyond, and not only will they know who he is and what he is said to have done, but they will also give you their take, their reasons, their opinion about a man they almost certainly have never met, but definitely know plenty about. Many of those assessments still reach a startling conclusion. A firm belief Mr. Rainey is a killer and his wife, Corinne, was his victim. Even though he walked out of court an innocent man after being acquitted of those charges more than a decade ago. They know he must have been up to something because he put phone taps in his own house before his wife died. Even though a judge threw out those allegations before they even reached a jury room. And so many of those people are certain those homicide detectives must have targeted the right man. Even though Mr Rainey won one of the biggest defamation payouts in Australian legal history against the WA police. Such is the cut through of the case of the state of Western Australia versus Lloyd Patrick Rainey. So today and next week, we will cut through it ourselves and in our first double episode on Court in the Act, explore the tragic, dramatic, mysterious, controversial and ultimately still unsolved murder of Corinne Rainey. To help me do that unpicking is Robin Napper, a former British detective superintendent, an independent forensic investigator and one of those who was called on to defend Lloyd Rainey when it seemed the whole of Western Australia was convinced of his guilt. Robin, thanks so much for joining us on Court in the Act, mate. It's a pleasure. So, firstly, tell our listeners a bit about your career background and eventually how you came to be involved in one of Western Australia's biggest murder mysteries. I was a career police officer in the UK, Tim, and my boss at the time was headhunted by the New South Wales Police to go over as Commissioner Peter Ryan in 1995. And he walked into a heap of problems. He walked into a Royal Commission, and of course he had the massive Sydney Olympics planning to go through. Mm -hmm. So in 1998, he asked me if I would go over to Australia for two years, effectively on loan, <laughs> and bring out some skills and, uh, and, and assistance to the Australian police. Now, one of the things they didn't have at that time was DNA technology. They didn't even have the legislation. It was brand new, but it was turning policing upside down in the UK. What used to be unsolvable was now becoming solvable. And of course, one thing people don't know about Olympic Games is sadly there's a lot of uh, noughties going on in the Olympic Village. And um, the Ryan wanted the legislation in post for the Sydney Olympics. So I ended up going around the country on a bit of a roadshow, explaining to different states uh, how this new technology works, how it makes the unsolvable solvable, and really assisting them any way I could. After the Olympics, I went back to the UK, resumed my old career. Then really out of the blue in 2001, I had an invite from the University of Western Australia uh, to come to Perth uh, for two years to set up a forensic science centre, effectively taking forensic science from the classroom to the workplace because of all my connections. So in 2001, I came out to Perth to set that up and we had an advisory board and the representative of the DPP's office at that time was one Lloyd Rainey. So I met Lloyd professionally, and that's how we first met. In August 
2007, Corinne and Lloyd Rainey were one of the power couples in WA's legal community. Mrs Rainey was a Supreme Court Registrar, tasked with managing complex cases in the state's highest court before they reached trial. She was hugely well-liked and within that court's historic walls, respected for her mediation skills among judges, solicitors and barristers. And one of those barristers was her husband, Lloyd, whose own legal career had taken him from the Australian Government Solicitor's Office to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions via a stint as a senior Crown Prosecutor in Bermuda. He was effective, meticulous and ambitious, with eyes on a coveted senior counsel position and perhaps one day a place on the bench as a judge himself. The pair had been an item since 1987, had been married in 1990 and had welcomed their two daughters in 1994 and then 1997. But around 2003, tensions had bubbled up to the surface of the marriage. Mr Rainey's gambling was causing issues. The Bermuda posting did not suit the family dynamic and Mr Rainey's move to the bar to practice for himself was also a point of intense discussion. By 2007, those marital issues were so fraught that both spouses had made contact with family lawyers. Accusations, some of them bitter, had also been made. And so, on the evening of August the 7th, 2007, they had scheduled to meet at their Como home to discuss the details of a separation. Friends on both sides said on that day, the warring couple both seemed actually relieved that they might be able to resolve their differences amicably. Happy, even. But before then, Mrs Rainey was going to her regular boot-scooting class in Bentley, little over ten minutes away from their home by car. The class started around 7.30pm. She would usually be home by 9.30pm, 9.45 at the latest. But... Corinne Rainey never made it home that night, never made it home again, in fact, and was never seen alive again by her friends, her husband, or her two daughters. Robin, the background to the marital problems of Lloyd and Corinne Rainey, they were thrust very much to the foreground following her disappearance that night. Yes, look, with Lloyd's background, Tim, he always knew he was going to be a suspect. Uh, He was well aware of that, and he was completely cooperative and upfront from day one. He gave his fingerprints, his DNA. He allowed the detective access to the house. He allowed them access to his young daughters, who were obviously grief-stricken that their mother had gone missing. Uh, So from day one, he was very, very cooperative. The problem was the police only seemed to have one motive. And that motive seemed to be that everything generated from the marital split. They were not looking at any other scenario whatsoever. And when we got into the paperwork of the investigation afterwards, for example, we found that 96% of all the surveillance, listening devices, phone taps, uh, physical uh, tracking, was all on Lloyd. Everything was there to try and nail Lloyd as the suspect. And within 48 hours, in fact, um, of Corin reported missing, the police were already, already referring to Lloyd in terms of being a suspect in their notebook. So after 48 hours, that was the direction the train was on, on the tracks, and Tim, it never came off after that. And Lloyd, being a lawyer... Uh, There's a dichotomy there for me. Being a lawyer, upholding the law, you would think, well, you'd never suspect a man like that. But Lloyd got a feeling, you you say, um, and some of the judgments that we'll we'll come to in a while would seem to suggest you're right there, that the, the police theory from very early on was toxic relationship, there's a motive, um... There were, there'd been arguments, there'd been nasty emails. And in, in a lot of cases, you look at the spouse first, which is, you know, that's, that's regular detective work. But as a lawyer, um, Lloyd realised quite 
quite very early on that he he was going to be a suspect and 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 maybe as 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 was shown later the prime suspect but look at the different scenarios that could have happened to him this could have been a tragic accident corin may have gone somewhere run the car off the road and be lying injured somewhere she could have been killed in the car she could have tragically been abducted off the street like the Claremont girls or Ivan Milat's victims uh, in New South Wales. There were a whole number of different scenarios that could be at play in those first days. None of those were ever explored. It was effectively Lloyd, Lloyd, Lloyd from day two of the investigation. And as time went on, and as you, de- you sort of spent more time with Lloyd during your investigation or, or, or your, your part of the the whole case what did Lloyd tell you about how he felt about this getting this feeling so early on that that uh, they hadn't even found the car but they already thought they'd found the killer look Lloyd was so overwhelmed with looking after his children I mean the one thing that Corin and Lloyd had in common they were brilliant parents they really were good parents of those girls And Lloyd, along with the whole family, were desperate to know what had happened to Corin. So Lloyd wasn't consciously thinking during those early days of himself. He was thinking of everyone else, trying to look after everyone else, trying to give the police everything that they needed. Because, as you know, Tim, in the early days of an investigation, you just go gangbusters. You you grab as much forensic evidence as possible. You look for witnesses. I mean, Corin had been boot scooting at the uh, the Bentley Community Centre. You go to neighbours, you go to family. There's a lot going on. And I can tell you, Lloyd wasn't thinking of himself in those early days. It was all about the girls and the family. So, Mrs Rainey's disappearance obviously prompted immediate front page headlines and frantic public calls for help. Missing along with Mrs. Rainey was her car, the silver Ford Fairmont she had driven to her dancing class, but which had also not returned with her later the same night. Police, obviously, were desperate to find it, for obvious reasons. Find the car, they might find Mrs. Rainey, or at least a lingering trace of her. And, giving his first public comment since his wife's disappearance, Mr. Rainey, sat alongside his wife's sister, Sharon, to make his own plea for any information. All of us are deeply distressed and extremely concerned for Corin's welfare. Corin's sister, Sharon, and I are appealing to the public to come forward with any information that they may have. The media coverage was intense and sparked dozens of calls to Crime Stoppers. And eventually, a week on from Mrs Rainey's vanishing... A triple zero call. Oh, hi, look, I'm just wanting to report um, that missing car that for the, um, the the mother that's missing. I'm... One CDS 564. Was that on the news, was that? Yes, it was. It's that um, the Rainer woman. Rainer. Was missing for over a week. Incredibly, that car had been parked in the open on the side of a busy street for a week until the registration plate stuck in one mind and that call that you just heard was made. Just finding it was a big enough break. But astonishingly, what police also found was a trail of transmission fluid which had been left behind by that car before it had been abandoned on the side of that Subiaco street. That fluid trailed along Kershaw Street and Hatesbury Road into Thomas Street. It continued southwest into Kings Park along Saw Avenue, May Drive, Lovekin Drive, and then Wattle Track, where it stopped after about 50 metres. At that overgrown site was a bollard intended to stop cars in their tracks. In this case, when the Ford had driven over it, it had caused critical damage to the underside of the car. The oil trail had led police to there. And just 60 metres further on, they soon spotted a patch of soil and dirt which had clearly been recently disturbed. On top of that was a layer of leaves and dead branches and underneath it all was a dead body, the body of Corinne Rainey. 
Robin, this day, August the 15th, 2007, sticks in my mind for two very different reasons. One, it was the day after my son was born, and I remember my little family in the hospital room getting used to our new arrival when the news came on at six o'clock and the news of Corinne's discovery had broken through the news. Can you remember your reaction when you heard that news and the incredible way that the, the breakthrough had come? I think it was just enormous sadness, Tim, because up until then, Corinne had been missing. And we all hope and pray that they're going to come back safe. But when that's not the case, I then realised, obviously, with my background, there was a father out there that was going to have to bury a daughter. There were two little girls that were going to have to bury their mother. It was just huge sadness. I, I remember Princess Diana's funeral when Harry and William were walking behind the cortege, funny enough, and uh, I suddenly thought of Lloyd's poor little girls thinking they're going to go through the, an absolutely same sort of pain. It was just sadness that she'd been found dead. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you'd you'd already met Lloyd, so you you had a, 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 some somewhat of a p- uh, professional connection to him. But I take it at this time you had no connection to the case, whatever. Um, but obviously, as an experienced investigator, you know you would have had an idea of what police would and should have be doing after the, uh, a major breakthrough. Yes, yeah, so I, I think we've discussed this. They would be looking for. You see, memories are very fickle, Tim. People forget very quickly. They needed witnesses. If that car had driven through there, they needed people that had seen the car, uh, the boot scooting people, the the neighbours, the family. They needed to put together Corin's background. Uh, Unfortunately, it's it's a real thing in homicide. You get to know the victim better in death than you ever get to know them in life. You get to know all the background because somewhere in the background is the key to all of this. So you've got to go looking for it. So they would have been going gangbusters looking for evidence. Yeah. And um, and presumably the car uh, being the whole the whole fulcrum of it, um, forensics, you know, where, where had it been? Had it been there the whole time? Um, I mean, that would, that would have also become an, an immediate intense focus, I guess. Well, that was a major breakthrough, Tim. Um, As soon as the car was examined, it's quite obvious that Corinne's body had been laid along that back seat. Um, Her purse and all the contents were scattered all over the car. Uh, Something extremely serious had happened within that car. And later, after forensic examination, as we know, there were unknown fingerprints that were found in the car that were never eliminated. And there was unknown DNA samples. So the car is the crime scene and it's talking to you about what happened inside that car. News of discovery sparked talk, wildfire of speculation all across Perth, which one senior journalist at the time said was comparable only to when the Claremont killer had been stalking western suburbs women more than a decade earlier. In public, police were initially cautious in what they said. And what they did or were doing was being followed with the utmost scrutiny. A search warrant at the Rainey House on August the 22nd was apparently known about by a reporter before Mr Rainey himself. And such was the scrutiny that police began to look to themselves to see if someone was leaking to the media. Robin, in your experience, are leaks... Uh, common in high-profile investigations? Uh, Sadly, yes, Tim. Uh, In every country, uh, high-profile investigations means that, uh, certainly in the past, uh, the media, you you guys in the media, you're hungry for information, and a lot of the uh, not-so-reputable organisations will pay a lot of money for information. Mm. So, uh, unfortunately, yes, leaks are very difficult to stop. Yeah. So, subsequently, that search of that house was conducted with many lenses trained. A week later, no deep throat was needed to know what the police were now thinking. Detective Jack Lee openly said to the media that Mr Rainey was now a person of interest. Internally, as Robbins just said, he was already considered a key suspect. And then three weeks after that, 
in what was to become one of the most infamous press conferences in all of West Australian history, Detective Senior Sergeant Jack Lee said that to the media as well. He said the quiet part out loud. As a result of further investigations this morning, including the interview of Mr Rainey, he is now a suspect in the murder of his wife. He is our prime suspect because our evidence at this time leads us to believe the offence occurred at that house. That day, September the 20th, everything changed. Lloyd Rainey's life certainly changed, as did the life of his daughters, Sarah and Caitlin. Public perception inevitably shifted. A senior police officer had openly said Corinne Rainey's widower was the prime and only suspect in her murder. He must be guilty then, right? And in the view of those who came to defend Lloyd Rainey, that was also when the investigation, codenamed Operation Dargan, also changed, becoming locked on him. Even though, ironically, after that day, Detective Jack Lee was effectively cut loose from the hunt for Corinne Rainey's killer. Robin, those comments from Jack Lee have haunted him, Lloyd Rainey and the West Australian Police for more than 15 years. Do you think they materially affected the way the case moved from there? In a word, no. It was just a continuation of the thinking that we had picked up on the second day of the inf- of the investigation. Uh, Jack was just airing publicly what they thought, and, and that was the big difference. It did not change the police investigation one iota. So the, they, they were all, by September the 20th, a uh, little uh, six weeks after Corinne had gone, they were, they were already laser-focused on, on Lloyd Rainey. Totally. So, on the same day as that press conference, another search warrant was executed, loudly, at the Rainey home. Charges were laid that day under the Federal Telecommunications Act over listening devices placed in that home by Mr Rainey. But despite the police's public proclamation and the court of public opinion now firmly in favour of WA Police, what didn't come was a charge of murder. Not for a long time. While the case did move on, it appeared to proceed at glacial speed, with major developments still playing out in public. Mr Rainey made a very public denial of any involvement in his wife's death. And then, almost a year on from Detective Lee's comments, he launched a defamation action against the state government and the WA police, claiming his career and his reputation had been ruined by the prime and only suspect statements. As you would imagine, WA police inevitably fought back. While waiting for forensic exhibits to be processed overseas, police lawyers at home argued the defamation case against them should be halted while the murder probe continued. That request was denied. And it was Chief Justice Wayne Martin, a man who knew Corinne and Lloyd professionally and personally, who took on that case himself and set a deadline of 2010 for the hearing to begin. At the very end of that year, and with the defamation case looming ever closer, the police finally showed their hand. And they did it in the shadows of the Supreme Court, where Mrs Rainey and Mr Rainey had both worked. Police in Perth have charged well-known lawyer Lloyd Rainey with the murder of his wife, Corin. Detectives in unmarked cars pulled over the barrister's station wagon on Barrack Street as he was driving towards the city. In full view of the public, Lloyd Rainey was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife, Corinne. It was news which was almost expected, but still shocking when it was revealed. And it immediately set up one of the biggest and bloodiest trials in WA legal history, which needed to import a lead prosecutor and a judge from interstate because of the intimate connections which lingered between the Rainies and the Perth legal fraternity. First, Mr Rainey had to argue for his pre-trial bail release, which became a pre-trial preview into the allegations and how they would be defended. That bail was granted on the eve of Christmas Eve, 
2010. Look, I'm just very grateful that the court gave me a fair hearing. I'm really overjoyed at the result. Uh, uh, and I look forward to finally being able to prove my innocence. And so began work on both sides to prepare for one of the most contentious and controversial murder trials imaginable. Robin, when did you become involved in that defence work? Uh, after Lloyd had been trialled and uh, released on bail, uh, he asked to see me because he was aware of the work that I'd done at the university previously. So I'd had this professional relationship with him. Now, I had absolutely no idea if he was involved in this. Uh, for all I knew, he could have killed his wife and he'd covered it up and got away with it. I was totally independent. And when I met Lloyd, I just greeted him and said, look, Lloyd, I'm not a gun for hire. Mm. I said, if I think you've got a problem, I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you and show you. And he looked me straight back in the eye and said, good, that's exactly what I want. He said, I want the truth of this to come out. Mm. And from that day onwards, I've asked him some pretty damn serious questions, Tim, I can, I can assure you. Like? He's always been upfront and completely straight with me. And I've never... Even though I've tried to trip him up, I've never been able to trip him up ever in anything in the complexities of this case. So you boldly asked Lloyd Rainey, did you did you murder your wife? <laughs> I won't go into all those because <laughs> uh, I was looking at all the evidence that they were putting yep. in front of him. Right. Uh, Tim, you only had to see Lloyd in the company of his two daughters and the, the, the love and the chemistry between them. You can feel, you can feel that. Mm. You know, mm. and they were there the night when she was allegedly murdered. Mm -hmm. So you yep. don't even have to go to the question, did you murder his wife? You know, you can feel the fact that the girls know nothing happened in that house uh, that night. So that's as much as I needed to know. Yeah. Being in Western Australia at that time, I mean, this trial or the even the lead up to the trial, there seemed to be something on the news or in the paper, like every day. So the magnitude of it publicly was huge. But the, give us some insight behind the scenes about like the sheer size, like just how much material were you guys getting and having to sift through? And, you know, in, in what state was that material coming in? Were the police just dumping it on your doorstep in boxes? I mean, give our listeners some insight in, in, into the preparation of a of a, for a trial of this size and, and magnitude. Okay. In the past, the WA police had got in trouble for not disclosing their whole cases before trial. So what they did in the early days of this case was they went to the other extreme. They totally tsunamied us with paper. Boxes and boxes and boxes. It was always delivered on a Friday afternoon to make maximum inconvenience. Um, we literally had dozens almost running into hundreds of boxes of paper files. In the early days, we had nothing electronic at all. So someone had to sit down and start going through all of this, all of this mountain of paper. Tim, there were only a handful of us, mm. okay? Yeah, I was just about um, to say. Probably it was... a core number of five. Yeah. You know, we, we had a lead barrister, David Edwardson, mm -hmm. and he, he was supported by Tony Elliott, mm -hmm. uh, Laura Timbano, who was the solicitor, mm -hmm. Clint Hampson, who mm -hmm. was the forensic advisor, and myself. And between us, we were up against the state with hundreds of people, mm -hmm. um, a bottomless pit of money. It, it was the biggest David and Goliath case I have ever been involved in. But that, that's what we were stuck with. So I think I must be the only person on the planet that's read everything. <laughs> I spent months and months and months, almost years, reading through everything to make sure I didn't miss it. Because, of course, the police investigation, that's what I was there for, yep. for nothing else yep. but to look at what they'd done. Yep. The trial, the law, the client, the preparation, that was all done by the legal people. Mm -hmm. So um, Clint Hampson and I were looking at going through all this mountain of boxes, and uh, it was tough going, I can yeah. tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, did it, uh, was it a, a privilege, or was it too much pressure, looking back now, to work on a case like that? Oh, look, uh, when I say privilege, yes, it was, because, you know, obviously I've got my own very strong personal views about that, but that, that's not for this broadcast. But uh, <laughs> the more we read... And the more we looked, 
the more innocent Lloyd became and the more clues that had just literally been either ignored, swept under the carpet. And I was despairing most of the time that there was such a focus on one man, you know. Um, the investigation could have gone off in a whole number of different um, routes and areas. It never did. It was just shut off. And, uh, for example, I think I said 96% of all the surveillance was on one man. And there were a number of people where that should have been spread over and they should have been equally treated as suspects, the same as Lloyd. But it never happened. So I got more and more frustrated the more I read. So that trial, the Rainey trial, finally began on July 16th, 2012 before Northern Territory Chief Justice Brian Martin, who had previously overseen the trial of Bradley Murdoch for the outback murder of Peter Falconio. This trial rippled across the world and it stopped Perth in its tracks. On day one, Prosecutor John Aegis outlined the prosecution's murder theory. And that was that in one crucial hour, Mr Rainey had murdered his wife after she came home from her dance class and while their younger daughter was asleep upstairs. He then moved her body to hide it in her car before his other daughter returned home from a concert. When she had gone to bed, Mr Rainey then drove the body to Kings Park, dug a grave, buried his wife and then returned to his house in time for his girls to awake and depart for school. Despite the car conking out eight kilometres from the house because of the damage from the broken bollard. Mrs. A. Rainey had no enemies that the evidence will reveal, Mr. Aegis said in his opening address. No one else would have gone to the trouble of killing her and hiding the body. He had a motive to kill, he said. And that motive was Mrs. Rainey's apparent intent to ruin her estranged husband's legal career. Mr. Aegis said she knew his secrets, that he was a womanizer, that he was hiding funds, and that he returned to his significant gambling habit. He rolled the dice, Mr. Aegis said. He was a gambler. He murdered his wife. The case was largely circumstantial, weaving motive, opportunity and character together to try to paint Mr Rainey as a careful, quiet and competent killer. But there was some physical evidence. Crucially, two seed pods from a liquid amber tree found in the hair of Mrs Rainey after her body was discovered. Prosecutors claimed those pods physically linked her to her home on the night she died because there was a similar liquid amber tree on the Como property. A third seed pod was then claimed to have been discovered in the body bag used to transport her. And it was these seeds which defence barrister David Edwardson used to sow doubt into the methods of WA police. In short, he claimed the way they were found and the way they weren't photographed was really dodgy. Robin, take us through these seed pods and the issues with them. Uh, for your listeners, Tim, I'll explain. The seed pods were described as golf balls with spikes in them. So these were big objects. I mean, forensically, they're huge. So we decided to look at when they were first discovered to see how they would have got on the body. So I went back to all the photographs of the exhumation when Corin was found in Kings Park. There were hundreds of them. And guess what? I could not see the seed pods anywhere. Every photograph with her hair, I blew it up. I couldn't find it. Uh, it, it simply was not recorded in any of the photographs. We didn't have the original forensic notes of the exhumation, so we called for those, and the response we got was, uh, I'm sorry, they've been mislaid, they're not available. And to this date, we've never seen the original forensic notes from the exhumation. 
But there would have been a forensic pathologist there, obviously, given given the size and the scale of this investigation. Yes, he he he, he certainly was. Gerard Cadden, a mm-hmm. very experienced pathologist. Uh, the body was taken to the mortuary after it was exhumed, and Dr. Cadden actually examined the body with forensic officers for 17 minutes that evening uh, to try and give the investigators some clue about how Corinne had died. You know, she might have been stabbed or shot or whatever. And there's a 17-minute video uh, of him going through her hair and examining her clothing. There are no seed pods anywhere, not one single golf ball with a spike on, if you, if you could think of it like that. The following day on the Friday, we had the full autopsy. So that started in the morning. There was a lunch break. And the first sight of two seed pods was a photograph taken at 1.34 in the afternoon, which was in the middle of their refreshment break. And it was two pods with a couple of strands of hair on them on a green cloth taken, presumably, in the mortuary. And that, that was it. There was just those that picture and one other picture of these two seed pods. There was no photographs of the seed pods or record or re- uh, recording of the seed pods on the body. Um, after the autopsy on the Friday, uh, all the material was taken back to the forensic center. And to follow the seed pod story, I've got to fast forward to December, four months later. Because in December, four months later, the police decided to search the body bag that Corrin had been brought uh, from Kings Park down to the mortuary in. During this search, they allegedly found a third seed pod in the debris in the bag. Again, this was never photographed. Uh, There's no photographs of this third seed pod. Uh, It got sent off to be forensically examined. And ultimately, when it came back from forensic examination from the CSIRO of all places, it it, had been everywhere, the third seed pod was found to have an extraordinary amount of material from the Rainey household. I mean, in fact, the defence team, we actually joked that this seed pod had frequent flyer points around the house. There was so much on there, uh, down to paint flex and everything. It was unnatural, Tim. It was completely unnatural. And for a seed pod that was meant to have been underground for eight days in Kings Park, there wasn't a skerrick of evidence of Kings Park on that pod. It, It just completely stunk to high heaven. It was unnatural and wrong. I actually had the biggest trouble of my life in convincing my own defence team, this is wrong. I I came to the conclusion they've planted this. The first two have been planted, but there was no forensic evidence on there from uh, Monash Avenue. The third one is overloaded. It's unnatural. These have all been planted to show forensically that Corrin had gone back to the address to be murdered. So that's how the C-Pod Staga unfolded in the defence camp. Looking at all that, you'd convince yourself, well, there's no other way they could have got there or no reasonable other way they've got there. But then you had to convince the others in your defence team that that's what your theory was. And they, they, they didn't want to accept that to start with. I was the ex-cop, Tim. I was the sceptic. <laughs> uh, I'd done this before. You know, I've been involved in hundreds of cases. And I know what, I, frankly, let's be blunt, I know what dirty cops do. OK, now the other team hadn't seen this before. Mm. And th- I was told, no, it's too high profile. They wouldn't dare. They wouldn't dare. They wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do that. So I had to systematically take them through everything. And thank goodness we had a, a, a barrister as brilliant as David Edwardson, who I, I managed to convince David. He sat down and listened. And David got it. The whole of the team then got it. Wow. We, we're dealing with something extraordinary here that... Uh, it's frankly so wrong, it's unbelievable. So, David Edwardson, a respected barrister, said in open court, in the biggest trial in Western Australian legal history, and certainly in living memory, that police, corrupt police, may have planted a key piece of evidence to try and frame a man for murder. That is not something you do lightly. Then after three months of hearings, he was scathing in his closing submissions. He said the case bristles with reasonable doubt. 
tantamount to a fantasy with conjecture at its heart. He said it beggared belief the father of two could have killed his wife at the family home while one daughter slept upstairs, hidden her body, buried the body, walked home and then appeared completely normal to the family and friends the following day. He pointed out that Mrs. Rainey was 11 kilos heavier than uh, her husband. He noted Mr. Rainey's painful back problems. Uh, He sounded alarm bells about those seed pods. And he said if Mr. Rainey was planning a perfect murder, it also beggars belief he would commit it in the family home with his children there or nearby. The Crown haven't come within cooey of proving beyond reasonable doubt that Lloyd Rainey was the killer, Mr Edwardson said. Less than two weeks after those words were uttered, Justice Martin convened the court again in front of an unprecedented attendance to declare his verdict. That verdict, after five years of investigation and months of brutal evidence, was not guilty. An acquittal, and an emphatic acquittal at that. The case for the state is beset by improbabilities and uncertainties, Justice Martin concluded. Crucial evidence is lacking, and the absence of evidence tells strongly against the state. Endeavours by the state to fill critical gaps and explain away improbabilities are primarily no more than speculation without foundation in the evidence. It is sufficient to observe that if the accused engaged in such a course of conduct, it is highly improbable he would not have exhibited some signs, however slight, of the effect of the night's arduous and traumatic events. Experienced police officers, one of whom was specifically looking for those signs, failed to detect any sign suggestive of the accused having been involved in the activities inherent in the factual scenarios upon which the state case relies. Robin, what were the days leading up to the verdict like and what was that moment inside the court like? Tim, you're as experienced as I am when judges and juries come back with verdicts. We all get the collie wobbles. You really don't know which way it's going to go. Uh, Although we were supremely confident of our position, uh, as soon as the judge came to the conclusion not guilty, it's obviously massive relief off your shoulder because Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think Lloyd was just technically innocent. I thought he was actually innocent. And that's a a big difference (laughs) in a court case. So I I thought the judge's um, judgment was was brilliant. He nailed it. He, He got it. 100%. After one of the most exhausting, exhaustive and expensive murder hunts in Western Australian history, Mr Rainey, Lloyd Rainey, is a free man and still is. But that freedom came at an enormous cost. Next week, we will continue the telling of the state of Western Australia against Lloyd Patrick Rainey which, despite the murder trial being over, was a case that was far from finished. Robin, thanks so much for joining us this week, mate. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Tim. And thank you again for joining us on Court in the Act. Remember, you can still get in touch with any questions or cases you want explored at courtintheact at wanews.com.au. Just like... Rebecca Coglin did over the summer recess, asking if we could cover the case of Lloyd Patrick Rainey. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in court, don't get caught short. Get caught in the act instead. See you next week. <laughs>